Hey, this is the original hotshot and the VIP of professional wrestling, Cassidy Riley, and you're listening to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. Oh, it's always so good. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. I'm Dean Hill. See you at ringside. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome one more time to the Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling podcast. And today, once again, we have an amazing episode. I really feel like we're kind of hitting our stride here, Jut. So anyway, welcome to the show, my co-host, my brother from the same father and mother, Jared the plastic chic street what's up brother yeah i'm looking forward to today it's good it's gonna be a good conversation i think you know <laughs> yeah we uh we you know this guy that's been in the business he wcw wwe wwe ecw whatever you want to call it tna ovw ovw <laughs> yeah i mean yeah whatever you want to call it so i mean he's he's been around he's been on the indies i mean he's he's got he's got some experience and uh should have yeah. some good stories for us and Plus, he's an incredibly nice guy. I can't even tell you. I'm going to tell him later in the show, but he's on my Mount Rushmore for nicest guys in wrestling ever. Because, I mean, Joe Gomez is one of them for sure. I, you know, had him on the Wolfie show. And then, of course, you know, Cassidy is also very nice. Yeah. I just was like, you know what? It would be cool to have him on. You know, so many people during this time. And, of course, you know. One thing we would love to say is Merry Christmas, but we'll get to that. But everybody does a Christmas or whatever episode for this time of year, and I just didn't really want to do that. I just kind of felt like, why don't we give them a gift instead of making it a show? Let's give them a gift. So, hey, I hope you all love Cassidy Riley. You know, he's a great gift to anyone. He's got a gift. Man, I'm just excited to have him on, and, you know, hopefully everybody enjoys it as much as we do. So, yeah, hopefully he's he's just uh, in a talking mood. I'm sure he I'm sure he will. But you've talked about how nice he is. You know, anybody that's nice to my brother, I'm I'm cool with. So, <laughs> well, ditto. Yeah. So, well, you know, with that being said, you know, our last episode we had the wrestling superheroes, and from what I can tell from downloads and listens and all that and views and all that, seems to be really well received. You know, I think Cash with his podcasting debut, I think he did pretty good. What about you? Yeah, I think we've definitely got Colossus uh, <laughs> cast in a, in, a, in a future movie with the wrestler <laughs> if we need to. So yeah, maybe Cassidy <laughs> Riley can be Colossus. Hey, Cassidy Riley, Colossus, yeah. <laughs> oh man, he would be. You know, Cassidy would be a great superhero, man. But anyway, yeah. So Cash, obviously. You know, it's funny because you and I will text back and forth with him. I'm like, hey, yeah, this guy said this about the show, and it's yeah. crickets. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> crickets. He just doesn't really care, and I get it. I'm not trying yeah. to force something on him and make him. You know, he's a video gamer. He's he loves you know his friends and all that, and I get it. I'm not trying to you know push my stuff on him, and but it's just funny because I feel like that would give him some you know feel good. You know, it's like hey, but it's like yeah, he's like I don't care. Crickets. <laughs> And yeah, so, I mean, whatever. I think he could do it if he wanted to. I mean, dude, everybody's got a podcast. You know what I'm saying? Why not? Have oh, yeah. But Seriously. long story short, get out of school, get a career, then do the podcast. I'm just saying that was his first time. And it was pretty funny because, you know, he seemed like he was a natural. The cool thing that I heard everybody say is it sounded like we were having a lot of fun. And also, you know, the rapport with us is is easy because that's just a recording of one of our conversations. Just, just Yeah, we know. could have just been sitting there talking about that and, and I was just recording basically um, that's kind of what i like about this show you know is all of my shows is it's just an audio conversation that's the deal you know yeah. 
even our interviews where we do specifically ask questions directed at them, we also want them to be able to conversate. You know, they can direct the conversation as much as we do, you know? So, I mean, I mean, seriously though, I mean, you, you look at even our biggest guests we've had, uh, you know, Greg Gagne and, and yeah. Magnum and, and, and Steve Rosenthal even, and they were all just super easy to talk to and super, yeah, super nice. So, and I mean, even though my daggone stomach's in my throat with Magnum and my yeah. heart's beating fast with Greg, I'm sure you felt the exact same way with Steve. Steve was like a breakthrough episode for us, you know. Yeah. It was really something that, you know, you and I came into our own as the hosts. You know, that's how it should be. That's how it will be. And, you know, that's that on that. But with Magnum and Greg, you know, by the way, Greg has hit four digits on downloads. So that's awesome. I mean, I'm, I don't want to obviously. I don't really, it's tacky to just say specifics, but uh, yeah, we were super impressed by that. The other thing is, is the what if episode on YouTube with the ultimate warrior and sting. That one has has has, blown up. Oh, I know 25,000 views on a short we made 25,000. I mean, (laughs) yeah, it's, it's, it's just like what something we're doing is cool and something we're doing is right. So we'll go with that. We'll take it. Yeah, but it makes a guy want to just, I mean, there's only so many what ifs we can do, you know what I'm saying, With yeah. to, to keep it at that quality of a level. And I really feel like the Sting and the Ultimate Warrior one wasn't really something that a lot of people, a lot of comments were like, oh, I never thought of that. Oh, I never thought. And I'm like, you know, that's what we're here yeah. for. Well, anyway, I think, you, do you have any more you'd like to add before I... No, let's get this interview going, man. Let's go. All right. We'll be right back after these messages with our Christmas gift to you, the VIP, Cassidy Riley. Hey, guys. This is Wolfie D from PG-13. Check out my podcast, Live and in Color, with Wolfie D every Monday at noon. We're talking Memphis. We're talking ECW, WCW, WWF, everywhere that I've been. We even have some great guests, some Hall of Famers on the show with us every Monday, Live and in Color, with Wolfie D. This is the big picture, Michael Jablonski. Don't forget to tune in every week to Jablonski's Pissed Off on the Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. The Unbrawl in this sport He's gonna tell you all about it He doesn't care what you think You're gonna hear all about it by Jablonski Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling Podcast. Thank y'all for sticking around. Of course, this is a very important episode to us because we got my buddy Cassidy Riley on the show, the VIP. What's up, brother? How are you today? Man, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited. I I get to be the year-end guest, the the last show of the year. Uh, And so uh, thank you for for a huge honor and allowing me to close your guys' year out on your show. Oh, man, the honor is all ours, brother. So, you know, anytime we can have a actual professional wrestler on the show, we're going to take advantage of that. So thank you for coming on, man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thank you guys for having me. So how you doing, man? How's things going with you, brother? You doing all right? Good, man. Everything's good. Everything's been real good, real busy, you know, last part of the year. Uh, several shows, uh, myself and Bam Bam Malone are tagging down, uh, Bayou Independent Wrestling, which is based out of Louisiana. We won the tag belts, uh, last month. So going into the new year, current tag team champion. And, uh, I don't know, at, at 46 years old and getting close to 30 years into this business, I'm going to tell my age a little bit here. Uh, you know, those opportunities are special and you appreciate them more and more as they come along. Uh, so everything's been good, man. I have no complaints, uh, in just kicking along and seeing how much longer I can keep kicking. Man, that's awesome, Cass. I saw that on Facebook, man. I saw maybe it was Instagram or something. I saw you with the titles and bam, bam there. That's really cool, man. You know, I'm a co-host on the Wolfie D podcast as well. Everybody knows that. I talk about it too much. What? Probably, but- what? No. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, that being said, on that episode we had you on earlier in the year, you were saying, I think I'm going to be wrapping it up. But now you're the tag champs, man. So, you know, hey, congrats, brother. You know, <laughs> You, you know how you know how wrestling is. Anybody anybody that's been involved in it for any length of time, it, it's such a roller coaster. And you know, it, just when you if you you think you're you're about ready to get out, or 
They're trying to get out. It'll throw you one of those little dangling carrots and like, yeah, maybe just a little bit longer, maybe just a little <laughs> bit longer, you know, but at yeah. some point in time, you, you, we, everybody has to be realistic. And, and, and I'm at that point, you know, my career is definitely as far as full time in the ring and actively in the ring is, is really drawing close to an end. And, and there's no doubt about it. I can still, you know, I can still do it, but man, it hurts a lot worse. <laughs> it takes a lot longer to get over. Uh, and I, but I still love it and I still, still appreciate every aspect of it. So I'm just treasuring, you know, the matches that I do have left, uh, the time that I do have left, uh, uh, to actively, you know, be at every show or every other week or every month, whatever the case may be for the promotion. Uh, yeah. doesn't mean I still won't come in and visit. Doesn't mean, I, you know, I don't want to be able to help out somewhere behind the scenes and, you know, I'm kind of transitioning. I'd like to kind of transition into some some uh some other a- avenues of the entertainment industry so there you go uh, there you go yeah man uh just you want to break a little news we'll give i'll break a little news here on give me back my pro wrestling podcast but i can't say too much but i just recently finished filming the iron claw and what a great experience and so that stuff like that is more what i'm wanting to transition to be able to do uh post wrestling and, and what i do finally uh, decide that it's time to give it up for good. Brother, that is awesome. I didn't know that, man. I, now uh, that's yeah, sweet, no, man. Nobody does. Congratulations. We broke a secret on your show. <laughs> Woo! So if I get fired from the movie now, <laughs> it's because of you. And I'm going to oh. blame your podcast. Yeah, it's, no, it's our it's, fault. You know, I really, I can't say anything, but it was it was a great experience, and I appreciate it. And I'll tell you what we'll do is once the movie comes out, I'll come back and we'll do another podcast. And, uh, We'll talk strictly it. Yeah, and we will talk oh, world awesome. class in the Iron Claw. So, okay, I'm not going to ask any more about that because I don't want to get you. You've already given us enough here. But it, you got us uh, salivating, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wow, bro, I'm so proud hey, man, of you. We're man. not even five minutes into this podcast. We're already we're already dropping breaking. bombs. Yeah, breaking. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love, love it. Shoot, man, everybody, yeah. watch out. Yeah. So, okay. I don't even know what to go next now. Everything is just rip up my work here. Okay. Well, bro, yeah, that is super- kind of- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm excited for it to come out and, and all aspects. It was a great well, experience. Well, so we've even been talking about this movie since the beginning when it, because this movie is exactly what this podcast is about. Give me back my pro wrestling, you know? And the whole point of it is that me and my brother are just recording our conversations. You know what I'm saying? That's all we're doing here. Right. So it seems like that movie. And again, I'm not asking for any more than you want to give, but what I'm saying is, is it seems like that movie is really paying attention to detail on stuff. So I'm happy for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. And like I said, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the final product as well as I know there's going to be a lot of other people out there that are too. Oh yeah, definitely, dude. That's really cool, man. So, all right, well, all right, that's it for give me back my pro wrestling. There's nothing more. To <laughs> yeah, say. Where, do you, where do you go from here? Huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> here's here is where we go. Okay, so this is the Christmas time of year, and so what we're going to do right now is we're going to go back to the very beginning. All right, now ultimately, I like to do very deep research all over the internet, but sometimes the starting or the ending point for me is Wikipedia. Now, I know Wikipedia isn't always correct because anybody and their mother can go on there and change whatever it says. But here's what I'm saying. I read something on Wikipedia here about you, and I'm just picking some interesting pieces, but it says, in the early years that you became interested in wrestling at the age of six after seeing a gory picture of Abdullah the Butcher in a PWI issue, and at the age of eight, you actually received a pair of tights from your mother and aunt as a Christmas present, so it's Christmas right now. Tell us, is that true? That that, Every bit of that is true. Yeah, and I agree with you on Wikipedia. And what's funny about Wikipedia is they... You know, somebody had sent me a link to my page at one time and I got to reading it and there was, you know, several things that were incorrect. And so I was you know, going to go on there and I was just going to fix it for them. <laughs> and then they ended up kicking me off for like a year. They wouldn't even let me edit nothing for a year. I don't know who I pissed off by doing that, but I was just trying to help them. Yeah. You know, give them some credential. But that's true, man. That's exactly true. I uh, saw that picture of that dude and I can still remember it like to this day, like it was yesterday because it, it changed my, you know, it changed my life. And it opened a world of these, you know, 
mythical creatures and just uh, this this storytelling that was incredible. And as a six, seven year old kid, man, it just captivated me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sat down, you know, would watch every wrestling program on TV from start to finish every week. And back then, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, almost every night of the week, you catch some type of wrestling program. So, I mean, that's all I did. And then, yeah, yeah. Now, that was probably one of my favorite Christmas gifts ever as a kid. And somewhere there's a picture running around with me in those wrestling tights that my, my mom and my aunt made uh, awesome. with some bandanas on. Yeah, dressed up like the Rock and Roll Express. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's awesome, man. <laughs> Were you Ricky or Robert? Uh, man, I loved them both. I just, either one, I both. was such big fans of all of both of the guys. But what was so funny is they actually, and back then, like, the wrestlers never did an autograph sign and hardly ever at the, at the events. Right. Uh, Mid South was it was in town and they were gonna have an autograph signing and with the rock and roll express. So I'm like, oh my god, this is fantastic. So I'm standing in line with a million, you know, there was probably a few thousand other people, mostly women. And when I get up there, I didn't have any, I didn't, I didn't have anything for me signed. So I just took my ticket envelope and ripped it in half and let them sign the inside <laughs> where it was blank. And I handed the paper to to Ricky and I called him Robert and he just looked at me and said, I'm Ricky. <laughs> Sign. It was just like you know, you could just tell like I right, just kid, you know, this kid don't even know who we are, and they killed me, man. It just crushed my soul. I was like, oh, I'm so stupid. How could I do that? How yeah. could I call Ricky Morton? How could I call him Robert? And yeah. <laughs> and so when I reminded him that years later, once I kind of got to know him, he laughed and rock and who laughed, you know. Uh, and that, and that's the great thing about about this business in my career. Like those guys that I idolized and got me into wrestling. Later, Robert Gibson would become a very good friend of mine and, and be one of my trainers when I was in uh, Ohio Valley Wrestling for WWE. So it, it kind of goes back to everything in my career has kind of been such like full circle. It, it, it would just go back one other, you know, we can kind of touch on that just a little bit more. Like, so early in my career, I was able to wrestle in Dallas and I was able to wrestle at the Sportatorium. Uh, so getting back wow. and, you know, then – this deal come up with Iron Claw. It was so special to me because there was just another aspect of my career where it comes full circle back around. So it's been like that for years. And I'm telling you, and I think that's one reason I am content with, with, be, with it being to close to the end of my career. So I've got to experience and do so much fun stuff with so many cool people and to where, you know, I, I'm just happy with, with, with what it's given me and, I don't want to stick around and try to take too much. Yeah, it does feel like you have really squeezed every bit of the drop of juice out of this sport you can get. You know, it feels like because I feel like you've just been everywhere, man. And I mean, you've had such a cool career. I mean, did you get to main event mania? No. But hey, at the same time, I think you've done some incredible stuff and I can't wait to get into some of this. But before we get into that, one more thing from Wikipedia and then I'm going to stop. So it says you were initially trained by Lolly Dude, correct? But then you got a little finishing from Tommy Rogers and Terry Taylor. Now, before we get to Lolly and those guys, talk about what led up to that. Were you an athlete in high school? Did you play a lot of sports? What led you to wrestling? Yeah, I did. I was actually on a uh, state championship football team, a state championship baseball team in high school, and yeah. a small school. Uh, but even in high school, I graduated high school when I was 17. Yeah. And I still okay. really hadn't started filling out a lot. Uh, it was after, you know, my senior, my senior year, the football season. And I just decided I was at school only half a day. I still had the other half the day to where the person was taking me and, you know, we were riding to school together. We're still in school. So I had like three hours. So to kill time, I just got in the weight room and I yeah. just really started kind of hitting the weights and trying to get in good shape. And I really didn't start putting on any size until after all of my high school sports days were over. It was in the second half of my senior year. I started kind of bulking up a little bit, but I just knew, man, I knew that like I did, I don't know how to explain it other than I, I just knew that I had to at least try it because I loved it so much and right. if I didn't try it. I'd always regret it. So just little, little ways I started trying to just chip away at it. Okay. So how do I do this? How do I get involved in it? I met some guys who were local, uh, who were local wrestlers down here at the time. 
got him, just didn't <laughs> bug him to death. And finally, you know, got him to where they, they didn't have a ring, but they would, they were showing me stuff outside, you know, just laying some real basic foundation for me. And then I got in touch with, with Lolly and them, and those guys were doing some TV in Mississippi and Louisiana and Arkansas area. And I just fell in and, and, you know, he had a ring. So he started training me. And then like Terry and Tommy, Terry Taylor, and Tommy Rogers, they were coming in and doing the TV for them. So when they were in town, I'd get a chance to get in the ring with them some. So it was, and that's kind of how it all came about. But, you know, I did play high school and uh, high school sports. Yeah. But, I think it was my love and drive for the wrestling that, that really got me there. Yeah, because, you know, I know a lot of guys, we always joked around high school that we were the four horsemen or, you know, we would always walk around acting like we were wrestling. And there is even like an unofficial version of WCW walking around the halls. You know, yeah. the funny thing is, is you were actually, we're close. You're November 21st, 76. And I'm not trying to dox you. My son just taught me that word, so I don't even know if I'm using it right. <laughs> I'm actually November 28th, 1978. So I know the oh, yeah. Yeah. That feeling graduating when I was 17 because you probably started when you were four, right? You, right. you were a, yeah, a November exactly. baby. So, yeah, I know That's that right. feeling too. <laughs> so, okay, then you meet Lolly and you start learning some stuff. What was your initial idea that – now, again, I know it gets shot down as you meet other people and you start to find – tune your craft and stuff but what was your initial idea for what you wanted to be in pro wrestling obviously you know probably the top guy but you know what i'm saying like what was your character idea did you have a specific idea no, in mind i no? really i didn't i didn't i really didn't have a character idea at all i just wanted to learn and uh <laughs> you would see you would like i would see guys i I don't know. To me, it was always more important about learning. I didn't, they just kind of taught to me, learning the business, and then right. everything else will kind of come uh, as it comes. But if you don't have good foundation and good fundamentals, and you, you know, nothing else matters after that. And so, to me, those that's how you train the guys who end up becoming the workers of the workers. That that's almost all of them. The guys that I idolize, you know, uh, who you know, Dr. Tom Pritchard and the guys who can top trainers now that teach the best workers. I think that's how they start. And that's kind of the, the fundamentals they instill in their kids. And it just has that, that system always seems to work no matter what you may yeah. not have the, the, the brightest lights of your career. You may not headline WrestleMania. You'll always have opportunities. You'll always be able to pick up the phone and get work. You, if, you know, if you have those found those foundations and those fundamentals. So, and, and I really wasn't creative enough at the time to have a character. <laughs> I was trying to do all I could to learn the holes and the moves and how to do them right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, for sure. You know, I was yeah. focusing on that more than anything. I know the story here basically because what's happened is Lolly did the main training and then you've had Terry Taylor and like you said, Tommy Rogers finishing touches and stuff and, and, and additions after. But, you know, your your body is very similar to Tommy, I think. I think you guys have a, a very similar look almost. Now, and you know, he's one of the guys that's always had a great physique about him. So, you know, that's a definite compliment, by the way. So, Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And Tommy, man, I don't think Tommy gets enough credit for his He body. doesn't. Yeah, he I definitely really doesn't. doesn't. He had a great drop kick, a great punch, and man, he had so much fire. I remember him telling me a story one time that when they first got to uh, is either uh, the Mid Atlantic or the Georgia TV, uh, he was real young before he was one of the Fantastics. He was just coming in doing some preliminary matches. He was he was doing a tag match with somebody else, and they got in there. And he he just started firing up and they couldn't cut him off. Like he just kept, you know, he just kept firing up. And they just couldn't stop him. And that's kind of what led him to get noticed. But he was like that his whole career. He was just a little fireball man and just so good, you know, technically good. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, he just doesn't get quite the recognition that I feel like he deserves. Yeah, so on here, we've got like a theory. Uh, it's called like Sons of the Road Warriors. So basically, you take the powers of pain, you take demolition. Even though these guys are sometimes even older than them, their gimmick is the reaction to the Road Warriors. And so Tommy is one of the Sons of the Fabulous Ones. You know what I'm saying to me? Yeah, if that yeah, makes yeah. any sense. <laughs> that makes total sense. I, I would, I could totally see that. Yeah, and you know, those guys had similar characters and 
yeah. uh, similar work styles and gimmicks and, and all of it. So yeah, I could, I could totally see that. And I would agree with that. You know, the fabulous ones to me are, are definitely the start of something, but then the rock and roll, then the rockers, then the midnight, you know, the midnight rockers, I should say. And then of course the fantastics. And at first I didn't like them because they were replacing my rock and roll express. You know what I'm saying? But then right. y- you, you lose that and you're like, okay, these guys are great on their own. They're, they're kind of their That's own right. thing, you know? So, and Bobby Fulton and, and Tommy Rogers, man, what two great, this is such a great tag team. And to me, you know, I know Bobby's still around. It's such a shame that Tommy's not around still. I hate to hear, you know, that he had passed and stuff. And did you have much contact with him throughout his life? Yes, we, we kept in contact a little bit. Uh, the last time I saw him was when WrestleMania was in New Orleans. And they okay. had a mid south reunion down uh in New Orleans that same year and he he had came in and we had hooked up at uh, uh at one of the shows that I was on. He came to see me and we got to visit a little bit and that was the last time I got to see him. Yeah, it's a shame, man. Which I was probably it. a year, maybe two years before he passed away. Yeah, yeah. I'm man. horrible with dates. Man, it's, it's okay. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Wikipedia is for. No, I'm just kidding. That's a bad. Uh, anyway, you're going to edit it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just go and edit it. That's right. <laughs> exactly. You'll get you kicked off just, for a year. Yeah, don't do that. Don't get kicked off Wikipedia. If you want to know how to ask Cassidy, but other than that, don't get kicked off anyway. Yeah, yeah. I'm the Robert of this pair. Jimmy's the Ricky. Um, <laughs> and, and I had brown hair. He had blonde hair. So we it was a natural fit for us. Yeah, um, we both had yeah. mullets. <laughs> yeah, we both had mullets at one time. We'd be very stylish oh, now. Sweet but... mullets, man. <laughs> yeah, those sweet are sweet. Mullets. I, had, I had a few. I, you know, I even remember like the short hair on top with the perm in the back. You boys have a yeah. perm? Yeah. I, <laughs> I, had a, I, I had a natural like waviness to my hair, so I didn't really need a perm. Uh, yeah, I had, I had the rat tail, so it was like a, yeah. a per, it was oh, a yeah. mullet with a rat tail added on. So yeah, sweet rat tail. <laughs> <laughs> Cassidy, so I, I was uh you know falling down a YouTube rabbit hole watching some of your matches, and I came across one from WCW Saturday Night where you wrestled Hale with Jimmy Hart, and yeah, man, that just looked like a that just looked like a a, a rough time and the and the finish. Tell you the story on that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We got absolutely. to say a story of that. That was my very first loop in with WCW. My very okay. first WCW show was the spring break show at South Padre Island. So if oh, you're going to wow. go in, what a better way to go in than the spring break show of year, right? <laughs> so we go down to South Padre Island, and when we pull across the, the bridge going into the island, I mean, there's just cars everywhere. And keep in mind, still my first wcw show so i'm like a kid at the candy store we yeah. get to the hotel we get out we're going inside we're we're, we're checking in and just fans everywhere and it is i mean it was just spring spring break with a bunch of wrestling fans it was awesome yeah, yeah. Plus i was getting paid really good to be there yeah. the end of that loop we were doing that that show was uh in uh beaumont texas uh and we so we did uh, Nitro on Monday, Thunder on Tuesday, and Beaumont on Wednesday, I believe is what it was. And that was for the Saturday night show in Beaumont. I was originally scheduled to work with Lash LaRue on that show. So when okay. we get to the building, I go in, and I see the lineup, and it's me and Lash, and I'm thinking, oh, man, that's great. That's going to be fun. You know, we had like eight minutes, me and Lash at eight minutes, about the same size. We ought to be able to tear it up. Then I come back later. And I, Mickey Jay's erasing the board, and I see he's erasing my match, and I'm like, oh man, what happened? And then he rewrites it, Cassidy versus Hell. And I knew Emery previously. We actually wrestled together in Mississippi when we were both starting. Sweetheart of a guy. So, uh, and it was the first time I'd got to see him in a couple of years. So I go, and he's like, oh man, I heard they switched it to me and you. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, dude, I'm sorry, because I mean, it's like it's going to be lights out in 30 seconds, because they're just giving him this monster push. But what come to find out, Frankie Lang was originally supposed to wrestle Emory, and he didn't want to do the stretcher job. So he went and had it changed, and then he worked with Lash, and then I did I did the job with Emory, which I didn't yeah. mind because Emory was my friend, and I was like right. I said, it was my first WCW trip. I was going to do whatever they told me to do anyway because I wanted to come back because they were paying me good. And then, but that's kind of the backstory on that. It was fun. Uh, Emory was a great guy. He's another one of those guys that was taken too early from us. Oh, yeah. I think he, at one point in time, he had potential to be a really big star. 
Yeah, he had that monster look. It was a. Uh, he was uh, he was a monster, man. Whoo, he was a big guy. <laughs> at, at the end of that match with it the, with the spike pile driver, I was like, oh my god! I was like, <laughs> yeah, my mom just, was there. Yeah. She thought it was real. <laughs> oh yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> she was that so just, upset. Yeah, that just shows how much trust you have to have in the person you're in the ring with to just uh, yeah, to go man, with it. it yeah, his yeah. legs were so big. I don't know if my head could really. If he wanted them to, you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, yeah. and like I said, I, I had known him previously from stints. We had worked shows together in Mississippi, and I, and I trusted him. He was a good guy. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's he, awesome. he, he could have, uh, you know, really, if he had hit the right thing, he could have probably been something big. But no, he like, been big and, star. Yeah, yeah and just, they were kind of building him to that way. I think he made his debut, like, one night he appeared on Raw and destroyed some people, him and Jimmy, and then I don't know what happened after that. They kind of just pulled the plug on it, and yeah. it wasn't long after that. You know, he, he he had passed away. So I don't know. Maybe the company saw something. I, I'm not sure what it was, but he, man, he that guy had the size and potential to be a big star. And it's, it's you know, some of that time in WCW and everything like that, that's when Russo and Bischoff were kind of, you know, back and forth as far as who was controlling things. So, you know, well, yeah. And I mean, come on, let's, let's be real. WCW let Steve Austin, go. you know what well, I mean? Sometimes yeah, exactly. their judgment yeah. on talent was not the absolute best. Yeah. They let Triple H go. Two of the two guys have become two of the biggest stars in the history of the business. Uh, Kevin Nash, they let him go on his first run, Scott Hall. So their track record at times was not, was not the best. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't say it better. You know, and how cool was that, though? Because, I mean, we're both Southern boys here. We're, you know, from Virginia, obviously the top of the South. <laughs> and you're from Louisiana, which is literally the South. <laughs> yeah, you know, the bottom of the South. Yeah, well, I mean, you're the South South. You know what I'm saying? So send us some boudin while you're at it. But anyway, <laughs> so how was it getting that with WCW, man? I mean, I know that was like our wrestling, right? I mean, I assume that's the same for oh, you. Oh, yeah. You know. Oh, it was, it was, man, it was incredible. Yeah, it, it, was, it was, I was so excited. You know, Bert Prentice had had a deal with, where uh, he, he was bringing in some of the power plant guys because I was working Nashville at that time. And man, we were working sometimes four or five nights a week. And we yeah. were steadily, we had, we were steadily doing shows. We had a nice little territory built up. Bert had regional TV. So they would send some of the power plant guys in and start getting some experience before they would go up and start making their debuts on, you know, whether it be worldwide or nitro or thunder or whatever it was going to be. Right. So in exchange for that, you know, they were taking a look at some of us who were in Burt's territory at that time and giving us opportunities to come up and, and do TV with them. Everything, you know, it was, so it was really awesome. It was just that next step in your career where you finally get to go to one of the major companies and now you're learning okay, this is how everything's done up here. You're starting to see behind the scenes how, <laughs> how everything's put together. And all that affects what you do in the ring. Once you've had that experience, you can see – I mean, you have to learn all aspects of the business to be to be at, the, at that top level, I believe. So when you first time you see that big production and just several 18-wheelers full of, you know, production and satellite equipment and all that, it's like, man, this is, this is incredible. And it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Is, there, is, is there anybody, like, you could uh, – like say like you know even when you were like at that first point with WCW that you were like somebody that was a big star in the company that was just like amazing to you that you're like they didn't have to be nice to me but they were just amazing. Well, one of the guys that comes to mind was Billy Silverman, one of the referees. Oh, and yeah, Billy was always really really good to me. Billy was always kind to me. He'd let me ride with him. You know, he, oh, they, wow. they took care of his rental rental car and hotel. So very cool. Billy was gracious enough. You know, he'd pick me up, and let me ride with him. And, and we would room together. And uh, so, yeah, Billy Silverman, and he's a lifelong friend to this day. He's one of the, you know, close friends that I've made in this business. And, and I always appreciated him. And because he kind of gave, you know, people would see me with Billy and knew Billy was cool. They accepted me a little bit easier because of that, you know, guys oh. in the locker room. So yeah. I, I, you know, I appreciate Billy doing that for me. Yeah, Billy's kayfabing us on an interview, but yeah, I got nothing but good things to say about Billy. <laughs> Billy, no. <man. laughs> Tell him we don't bite, man. <laughs> call him out. Call him out right now. You can have no. all the time you need. I give you permission to just light him up. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I'll do that. I couldn't do that to Billy, though. Anyway, so, you know, you brought it up, man, and I don't want to get past that too far, is the Music City Wrestling. So if anybody has been able to be on YouTube lately and see anything from the history of Nashville, I think it's Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. How cool has that been to see all that cool Dude, stuff that you might have thought I was lost to so- history? Dude, I'm so thankful that Brian ha- has been able to find as much as he has and has, has been able to put it out there. We had, we, I mean, we had so much fun during that era, and we had some really good talent. We were doing some really good stuff considering, you know, the budget that we had to work with for the shows and, and the production equipment at that time. You know, everything's so much more advanced now. But we were putting out some quality wrestling shows, man. And, and a lot of that stuff I thought was lost forever. So I, I really appreciate, you know, putting it out there on YouTube, the archives. And they, now even my kids can go see it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody who was any type of fan from the 90s or late 90s, early 2000s of, you know, the Nashville scene, uh, they can see it too. It was it was really fun. I, I, you know, I know he puts a lot of time and effort into it, and I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah, you, you doing that. It's been a nice trip down memory lane for sure. Dude, and it's incredible. And there's some stuff that's just so crazy, like Wolfie D and Chris Champion's storyline and, you know, all that. But then watching some of your matches that, you know, dude, I mean, you can tell you were, your body's feeling good. You can tell there's, I mean, not to say you ever showed injury, but what I'm saying is, is you're, you're like at a hundred percent and everybody is at a hundred percent and they're just absolutely killing it. And you know, the one thing, Bert, I worked for Bert, you know, when I got a chance to, and Bert was always very cool and fair to me, but also at the same time, Bert has a lot of other kind of, you know, some people hate him, some people love him. It, it, I don't, I don't want to, there's not get a lot in. of in between. <laughs> yeah. There's no gray area on Bert, but Bert was always good to me. And that's all I can take it on. But I tell you what, you know, other than the fact that he said TNA killed Nashville, which again, I get that, but you know, Music City, man, I feel like was really on the cusp of almost becoming something bigger, you know? No, I agree. It was great. It had, like, if you were to compare it to you know, wrestling in the last five years, it would have been like the Ring of Honor, I think, yeah, to, to totally. WWE totally. today. Yep. Uh, but the, the thing was, we we were doing some really good stuff, but, man, we were all still pretty young, and we were all still learning so much. So I, I tell people all the time, like, I, I knew how to wrestle before I came to Nashville. I learned how to work once I got into Nashville and started working with those group of guys. And it was just like taking it to another level from when you, you talk about, you know, we talked earlier about those found foundations and fundamentals that you're trained, and that's learning how to wrestle. Once you step up and start learning how to work, then that's another level. And I feel like I didn't really learn how to work until I got to Nashville. And then I was in there with some of the, some of the best uh, at that time and uh, to be able to learn from. So I, I appreciate Bert. I have nothing to good things to say about Bert. You know, I'm uh, just sad he's not here anymore. He, when people like Bert die, there's parts of the business that will die with it because there's nobody else that's going to be able to go and is promoting local shows three, four, five nights a week in a small tri-state area anywhere. Yes. Yeah, and drawing houses or drawing houses. TV. You know, nobody's drawing houses. Nobody use local TV anymore. Everything's live streamed, either YouTube or Fight TV or whatever. It's just a part of the business. Is like, like I said, when people like him are going, that part of the business dies with it. It does. And, you know, he was a carny in the good sense of the term. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so many people are like, most of the time. <laughs> yeah, most of the time. Yeah. But you know what most I'm saying? I mean, the double raffles and the, the certain things mm. like that, you know, stopping a match because he hadn't ran a raffle. And anyway, yeah, there's some funny stories there for sure. Bert one time looked at me and I was, I was, I don't know that we ever met during this time cast, but I was working a sheet gimmick early on as a manager and I, I come out there and Bert looks at me and I'm extremely Caucasian. There's no question about that. And Bert looks me up and down and he says, mm, he's like, you're pretty good, but we got to get you a new gimmick kid. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay. And then Dutch Mantel tells me I need a new gimmick. And then we worked on a different gimmick. So anyway, going from there, 
uh, you know, Burton Music City, and then obviously it morphed into USA Championship Wrestling, you know. But right around that time, you know, you're meeting guys like AJ Styles, Air Paris, all these guys. Talk about these guys. I mean, Air Paris is one of those guys, and I know we've talked about this a little bit on the other show. Air Paris, to me, is that that name that is forever ingrained like your name too it's forever ingrained in a time frame that these are the guys that if you ignore these guys you are not getting the whole story basically you know what i'm saying yeah well the guys like david young right paris aj styles chris harris james storm you know ron Killings hadn't made his big national debut you know hadn't had that that push lately uh, at that time uh uh, man, there's just so many guys in that in that time frame. Rick Michaels was one of the another one of those great workers. Him and Storm had some really good matches. Oh yeah, uh, but there was just a, such a group of guys there at, at that time between Georgia and Tennessee, and you know Bill Barrios was promoting down in Georgia, and of course Bert was in in Nashville. Well, they kind of would swap talent in and out a couple of big shows throughout the year, so you were seeing those guys pretty regular but that's what pushed you to be better man you would see those guys and be like man they're good and you would study them and watch how what they did and the reaction they got and that's what helped me grow as a performer and then getting in the ring with them and going you know and doing it in the ring with them as well guys who just wanted to be the best who got the business and was steadily learning and trying to absorb more wasn't afraid to make a mistake and sure wasn't afraid to fix it and do better the next time those are some of you know my most favorite times in my career. Yeah. We're all just coming up, just giving it 100%, just cutting our teeth and learning. And they're all good people. Like We had so much fun. We had just such a good group of guys together. Uh, and, and like you said, if you didn't – I feel like at that point, we made people take notice on a more national level. The it's some because sometimes let's be honest, it was really hard getting a break anywhere if you if you performed in the south, right? And we I used to say like you couldn't hardly get paroled out of the south and do a major <laughs> company that right. for whatever reason I don't know what it was it was just so hard you know uh, to to get a break if you if you were trained in the southern part of the United States or, uh, but I feel like that group of guys really kind of spotlighted it man there's some there's some really good talent down here who get it you yeah. know and uh i Definitely. was just honored to be a part of that and i i loved working with a- ap there paris was my first tag team partner before chase stevens and we had a really good run with the new south and you know Corey williams and ashley hudson those that's another couple of guys Great. that need to be on that list absolutely if you, if you didn't know what they were doing you know and hadn't heard of them at that time you wasn't seeing the whole picture of one of the best tag teams, or you know, in, in the country at that time, because they were dead gum, they were dead gum, they were dead gum good, man. Yeah. Me and Air Paris had matches with them, and I just learned so much from a psychology standpoint and how to, and how I watched them, how they developed those characters, and so Corey Williams got more heat, man, than anybody <laughs> I knew at the time. It was just yeah. crazy. Yeah, <clears throat> I fell down to Ashley Hudson, Corey Williams rabbit hole the other night, and I was just like, okay, this is the next one I'm watching. And then I look at my phone, and it's slowly depleting battery just because I'm watching increasingly amount of matches with those guys. In it. And you're exactly right. Anybody that gets a chance, look up Cassidy Riley, look up Corey Williams, look up Ashley Hudson, look up Air Paris, look up all those names. Then you then you mention David Young, who honestly I have a great story about him, Moonshine, and Hammerjack. That is, we'll tell that off the. <laughs> Air, but anyway, he, <laughs> they were impressed that this Appalachian boy could drink a little moonshine. And I was like, guys, uh, this, is, this is in my blood. Come on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt any, any of those three names were, <laughs> you were enjoying every bit of that moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were. So, you know, please go out there and look up those names and you will be you will be like, why are they not on the Mount Rushmore of wrestling at this moment? So obviously, AJ, what, what's funny is you, you hit on an interesting point. Some of the best wrestlers at that point had very Southern accents between you, James Storm. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? Frank, yeah. And, <laughs> and then, of course, and then AJ, of course, is probably the one that has the – it's the most Southern. And, it, you know, his song even says something about, won't get a load of this redneck or whatever. And it's just like, what? <laughs> but I love it. it you know, that song was initially wrote for Storm? For Storm, yeah. Yeah, James Storm song, yeah. And 
Yep. Anyway, well, I, I hate to see that, you know, you know, it all didn't work out with, with him getting into the WWE, but, but maybe things worked out the way it was, but we'll talk to James on his show. So that's right. <laughs> with that being said though, WCW R and B security, talk about that. Was that just a way for you all to get a little screen time? Yeah. And it was a way to get us up there. And again, it goes back to seeing how the machine is run. Sure. You know, and yeah. and being a very small part, of, you know, on television, but still getting paid really well to be there and to learn. And yeah. that's what that basically was was about. Yeah. We were there to learn and and, uh, and get education and, and have a small part in the show, and uh, it was great, man. Because we were used all the time. They used us all the time, so we were constantly figured in at some point in time to the show, uh, and with a lot of the big talent. You know, Goldberg and Dallas Page and Hulk Hogan. Shoot, man. Even if you just get 20 seconds in the ring with those guys to feel that reaction from the crowd, you learn. And that was yeah. a, that was just part of it. It was just such a great learning experience. And, and to be able to have been blessed to have worked with some of the top guys that's ever been in our business, too. Yeah. If you're a pro wrestling fan, there's something for everyone at the Cheap Heat TV Podcast Network. From the Pro Wrestling Discussion Show, Cheap Heat TV Live, to the Interview Show, the Jackson Interaction Podcast with the king of all wrestling media, Gene Jackson, to the silliness of the Whitey Jenkins Show, and the brand new Zip, Xander's Irresistible Podcast with Charles Anders, you can check them all out and much more over at CheapHeatTVLive.com. So, you know, WCW is ending and it's wrapping up. And then, you know, obviously that leaves as far as it goes. There's Ring of Honor, of course. There's really the only gun in town at that point, which was WWE. So there starts to be some rumors about some some promotion coming up. And, you know, I've even talked to other people about it. But what were you first hearing about TNA? What, what did you first hear about that? Uh, I was working in Nashville. and probably one of the top tiered talents in Nashville at that time. Uh, and so there was some scuttle going around, you know, that there was going to be some people coming in the next few weeks to, uh, to start scouting some talent. It was going to be the Jarrett's. And so we didn't know the specifics on how the show was going to be done. We had a really good idea. They were going to do a national type type television show. Uh, and sure enough, you know, the next couple of weeks, you know, Mr. Jerry and them came down to the fairgrounds and were watching the matches and started started signing people to deals. Yeah, yeah. So, what? Where did you fit in? And, and what did that get you any heat with anybody that you were working for at that time? No, no. So the original plans were uh, uh, after Chase, they were going to sign Chase and me, and Mr. Yeah. Jerry Jarrett wanted to do. A, a similar gimmick to the fabs. We were going to do a young fabs type gimmick. Gotcha. And then okay. we, we do, they, you know, they, they plan out the first show and ticket sales were not good. were abysmal. So he felt like he needed to bring in some newer faces. And that was the whole pro the whole, you know, purpose of the company at first was he wanted to find new talent. They wanted to promote young talent and grow their own stars. Uh, but when ticket sales were so bad, they started bringing in some of the guys who, who had been at WCW and some some other legends to try to push ticket sales. So it kind of pushed Chase and I out of the first couple of weeks of TV. And uh, once we moved in, they moved and switched the show from it was uh, from Alabama up to up to Nashville. You know, we started coming into TV. It was like the second or third week. Yeah. Uh, but that was the original plan was to make us like a new version of the Fabs. And then I think. Everything got so chaotic at, right there at the beginning that it just kind of got lost in translation a little bit. We, I feel like <clears throat> we kind of got lost in the shuffle of that deal. Gotcha. They signed yeah. a lot of guys yeah. with talent, or a lot of talent to uh, contracts, and that was the first time I, I felt like you know we just kind of got blended in and lost in the shuffle, and they wasn't sure what to do with us. And then, uh, you know, having to use the bigger names, and they, they require TV time too, so it just made it a little bit harder. To, to kind of break through that uh, initial glass. But I have to feel like we eventually did, but, you know, the early days of TNA, it was a tough go. It was it was a tough go for the company and everything. 
because it was a revolutionary idea. Nobody had thought of charging a weekly charge. I mean, that you didn't have a TV right. deal, you know. So in theory, you know, I remember pay per view on a Wednesday night, right? On a Wednesday you know, night, it's I, like what nobody are you doing? knew how that was going to go. And then, of course, there was a big, you know, there there was a big to do in the beginning about the numbers they were receiving weren't actually the numbers they were doing, and, right. and who was, right. uh, you know, at the helms of, of those false numbers. But uh, so, I mean, it was just a real struggle getting it off the ground at the beginning because of the new concept and everything else. Yeah. You know, it's funny because if you if you listen to some of that, you know, you listen to Jeff Jarrett's podcast or something, he gives a lot of that history. But also, you know, Jeff is also still a worker, <laughs> you know, yeah, so exactly. <laughs> So it's like, well, Jeff, is that really just your perspective? I wouldn't say anything bad about him or Jerry. They they're they're workers in the in the game, and and there's nothing wrong with that. That's what makes us love this business. So you know, with Chase and you all being the hot shots, I always thought that was a great tag team. You know, the matches with America's Most Wanted, man, y'all were killing it with them. You know, yeah. talk about that. Yeah, I feel like too. I feel like we were too. Again, you go back to four really hungry guys all four who really loved tag team wrestling and we knew each other so well because even though chase wasn't doing the wcw stuff like i was with harrison storm we all did that whole wcw tour for those last couple of years together we had spent a lot of time together and then chase comes in he's such a natural athlete and was so good in the ring he just meshed so well with us all uh and we man i just feel like there was a lot of stuff that's probably not even out there as far as the matches that we've had that were just, oh my God, man, five star. And I wish, yeah. I wish we would have been in a more digital age at that time to where we could capture everything we did. Cause I'm telling you, we put on some matches with those guys around the country that were just, oh, they were incredible. Yeah. You had to run there after that in TNA with where you did a lot of stuff with Raven. Right. How was that working? How was that working with Raven? And, you know, you were, I guess you would say like a protege almost to Raven in, in the way they portrayed. He, uh, he was not a fan of it at first. He, <laughs> not, he, he did not select me. The, the, the guys who were booking the show put me with him. Uh, he was not in a real good spot as far as he was upset with the company when they did it as well. Cause he had been the NWA world champion. Well, right. he dropped the title to Jeff Jarrett on a non-televised show at Border City Wrestling for Scott Moore, and he never got a rematch. And so he was already, you know, he was upset with the company about how he felt he had been booked. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they were a little upset with him, too, is why they did it that way. I don't know. I just know he was upset. He wasn't real happy. And then when they stuck me with him and he had no say-so in it, it didn't help the matter. <laughs> it didn't help the matter yeah. at all. And then yeah. not only that, then they asked me to dress like him. You know, yeah. He didn't want me to imitate him. He wanted me to have my own style. They wanted me to dress just like him. And so that rubbed him the wrong way. And I understand that. So it was a rocky, it was a rocky beginning. Uh, my wife, who was actually working for DNA at the time, she was the merchandise manager. Okay. She, she kind of watched it all unfold and she she ripped him a new one one night and after that we, we were really good everything was great but i think she said stuff to him that made him understand that the position that i was in and i think yeah. he understood better after that conversation and, and was more receptive to the idea and then it was fun and then it got to be fun you know once once he became okay with it and those walls kind of came down i enjoyed it and i, and I learned a lot from him that's he's awesome. like one of those guys man He's he's that asshole friend that you got, and as long as you know he's an asshole, everything's good. But until you figure that part out, he's like, oh, he's just an <laughs> asshole. You, I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? That's how he yeah. is, and that's how I see him. And he's like, oh, but I, you know, he's an asshole, but he's my buddy, and I think he's great, and he's done some incredible stuff. Yeah, I wish he were, and maybe it's by his choice, but I really wish he were more active somewhere, you know, writing. And it's just like Cornette. I think they've reached a point where they're like, okay, I've got my podcast. I've got my Twitter or whatever. I can say what I want. I don't have to worry about it. I make enough money on merch or whatever sales to signings and stuff. But I do wish his mind was somewhere helping the business more, you know? Yeah. yeah. 
I know that he was doing a little something with NWA and stuff, but I I don't know how active he is with that or if that's just like a random showcase or here and there. But sometimes he's too smart for his own good, too, though. That's what I was just about to ask. He's one of those guys that's like, sometimes he's too smart for his own good. He's like, just dumb that down just a little bit. These people will get, you know, they'll understand that a lot better. But uh, he's, he's very intelligent, guys. Yeah, that's what I was just about to ask you. But anyway, so you got to a point where that basically ended. But then the cool thing, man, is is you got a little run in the Fed. WWE, ECW. Well, and even before that, I got a little, I got a little run with with Dustin Rhodes at TNA too. And and yeah, yeah, go back to that. Let's just ask that. So Dusty takes the book and and uh, at TNA, and uh, I was Burt's champion in Nashville at that time, and wasn't actually signed to an official contract with TNA yet. Chase had gone on and started tagging with Andy Douglas and they were the naturals. Uh, so when Dusty took the book at TNA, we had a meeting in Nashville at TNA headquarters and, you know, he signed me to my deal. Uh, and then I was able to, the idea was to put me and Dustin together and we would eventually have a run with the tag belts there. Uh, so we got to do a little, a little, uh, a little bit, together not as much as as anybody had wanted at that time because eventually dusty would uh would leave tna and go back to wwe so just as we were really kind of getting the getting that rolling with dustin and i but again you know it's an opportunity to learn from somebody like dusty Rhodes. i mean dead young man it's dusty Rhodes. that guy's put out some of the best television in pro wrestling history ever if you go back and look at the stuff at wcw when it was so hot uh, with the horsemen all that was all dusty you know yeah. so to be able yeah. to sit under that learning tree and, and and have the opportunity and have somebody like him believe in you to give you an opportunity and then tag you with the sun you know <laughs> that that was always very special to me and dustin was just such a great guy he was always super kind to me and then you know that kind of segues into where you were going with the last question so dusty leaves tna and he goes to wwe well, my contract's coming up at TNA that we had signed, and I called him and said, "Hey, you know, I, I don't know what do I want. To, is there any opportunity for me up there?" He said, "Don't sign anything down there. Uh, give me, let me see what I can do, and I'll call you back." And so I, you know, I don't think TNA was going to renew my contract at that time. Scott Demore was taking the books, and I think he was taking the company in a different direction. He did, and yeah. I really wasn't figured into that. So Dusty took care of me, and 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 he's the reason I end up getting signed with WWE. Yeah. So okay, you did that incredibly well. You need your own podcast, cast, but we'll we'll talk about that <laughs> off the air. But <laughs> so tell me, tell me this. You know, obviously, I got to ask you this before we go too far into the WWE. Dustin, man, how underrated is that guy? Honestly, I know he's had a good career, but how Very. underrated? I mean, very, and I think here in the uh, latter part of the, his career, in the last three or four years, like that match with him and Cody, oh, and yeah. I put that up with some of his stuff, some some of his best stuff is Goldberg, like with him and Piper. You right. know, I think it was tremendous, and for him to be able to do it at that stage in his career, and at the point that I'm at in my career, like I can appreciate that so much more and realize how great he really is. Yeah, yeah, he's a great talent, and he's one of my favorites. Actually, he's one of my favorites of all time. Him coming in as his is kind of was doing his like a a mixture of Barry Windham and his dad early on. Yeah. That was kind of yeah. like the, right. the blend of those two. <laughs> but then he turns into his own thing, obviously with Gold Dust. And dude, you're right. The older that guy get, he's like a good, he's like a really good wine. <laughs> you know, he just gets better. So it's I it's, agree. Rid- it's ridiculous to see. So now, I before we get to WWE though, I need your your, your and I've heard you do it before, but I, I need it for this show. Your Dusty Rhodes impersonation. Oh, I can't do it, man. <laughs> can't. You, you've got it. You've got one thing that he horrible. used to say. You could. In you said public. If you will, baby. <laughs> We're going to get funky <laughs> like a monkey, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it doesn't do the man justice. No, it, it's understand. What would he say to you when he would? He was thinking of something. He he would say, "I'm genius in my ass off, baby." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it, Dusty. What are you doing over there? I'm genius in baby. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's awesome. <laughs> Not enough can be said about Dusty, man. He's just such a golly. Everything that I love about wrestling, he's probably a part of. You know what I mean? No, big sure. part of 
I mean, I, I can't even think of a time that he was in wrestling and I didn't love it. And people don't understand because we were Southern kids. So to us, he was our Hulk Hogan. You know what I mean? He sure. was, you, 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 yeah. we loved Hogan, but Dusty was the dude, you know? Yeah. Those Dusty and Flair matches, man. Oh my God. They were so, so good. Uh, he's another one of those guys. There's a few people in my life that I'll never be able to thank for all the kindness they bestowed upon me and the opportunities that was presented to me because of them. And Dusty is, you know, 100% one of those guys. I'll never be able to thank him for all that he did for me. And I, you know, I love him to death. And will always love him as a performer, as a person, all of the above. He, he, he's, he holds a special place in my heart for sure. Yeah. So I guess let's do this. Talk about the WWE. What, what, what was going on there, man? How, how did that work out for you? So, yeah, so I, I go up to OVW and, uh, it, at that time they had just sent a big group of guys. Like I think, you know, Cena and Shelton and, and all and Brock and all the them had been like the kind of the, previous class i guess before that the, the, the big class but again you know there was some really really good guys down there like paul Burchill and uh and chet the jet who were great in-ring workers and then you had trainers like al snow and robert gibson and then danny davis and uh it was really cool it was again you get to go back and see that local tv being done we would shoot tv on wednesday night Danny would stay at, at the arena all night at the <laughs> TV that we just shot and then have it ready when we would come back for Thursday morning for class. We would get to watch the TV we did edited from the night before, and then Danny would send it out to the station. So you got to see that whole process and, and uh, how hard Danny worked, how hard they worked to keep that place going and what an opportunity it was to be able to be there. Some people didn't understand that. I always appreciated it and the knowledge that they had of the business uh, of all aspects, you know, uh, yeah. Danny would edit that TV and all his cell. And it was, it was, so, it was a good little, good, good little TV show with some good talent. So it was fun, man. It was cold. I remember the first day I got there, I'd left Louisiana and it was like 75 degrees. I get up there and there's like three or four inches of snow on the ground. I'm like, Oh no, man, I'm a Southern boy. I don't do a lot of this white stuff. dude. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's incredible actually to think about because you, I mean, how much does it snow in Louisiana to be honest? I yeah. Mean, not a lot. Yeah. Uh, we lucky if we get one every couple of years, you know, right. like Carlson and a few years ago, we got a nice little dust and it shut, shoot it, man. It shut everything down for like four days. It was like, <laughs> no, there ain't no saw truck. You know what I mean? It yeah, yeah. snows down here. It's like everybody runs out and buys up everything in the grocery stores and think it's, you know, the end of the world. Yeah, yeah. You so know, it was a different t- culture for me moving up there in that Ohio Valley. And I learned, you know, driving the snow and sleet and everything as, as longer I was there. But it, it was an adjustment at first. Oh, no doubt. But, I mean, look at the guys you were there with, too. I mean, that was a crew of the kind of the next step. I know it says you you, you were you guys worked with Major Brothers, which they've kind of done their whole other thing now, you know, with, with you know, Kurt right. Hawkins and, and or, I'm sorry, Brian, Brian Myers and Zach Ryder and Matt Cardona, however yep. many names they have. But, I mean, do you, now those guys were totally the opposite because you're coming from the southern territories and they're coming. And I, and I, I mean that by the indies, but you know what I mean. They're coming right. from... The, the northern had you ever met with any of those guys that you wrestled with in ovw before working there no i knew uh sin Bodie. it was yeah. he, sin was the only guy that i knew that was there uh he had wrestled in nashville with us um uh, you know he right. was originally from canada currently resides in los angeles but just a great great guy totally. he was the only guy that i knew that was there when i when yeah. i when i when I first got there, but there, you know, like you said, there were so many good talents that, that they came out of there. Uh, Zach and, and Brian and, uh, you know, Drew was there. Who's, uh, with V Festus and now he's, uh, Carl Anderson's partner and, uh, Big LG, Doc Gallows, yeah, whatever. Gallows. Yeah, I yeah. Had a brain fart there for a minute. <laughs> it's uh, Drew. You said I mean, Drew. there was a lot of good, <laughs> there was a lot of good talent there too. And that was kind of, uh, and it was just so when Ace Steel was there, I'm sitting here now. I'm starting to think about names. Tommaso was there, uh, who is uh, Champa now, yeah, WWE. Yeah, 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 and yeah. he was there, and they were trying to use him as a manager. And then, I mean, he was so much more more than that. Right. Uh, 
but there was just such a good group of talent there. and Everybody's just trying to find their way. Uh, yeah. Drew McIntyre came there. Stu Bennett was there when I was there. It, and those guys end up having great careers. Uh, but it, you know, it was a bunch of guys. Again, you go back to really wanted it. We had the drive and loved the business, and we're trying to find a way just to get to the, get to the top. How did it work out? I saw I just saw your first appearance with the WWE WWE ECW brand was you were on on TV versus Marcus what's it, it Monty Four Brown Mon- yeah Mon- it was Monty yeah. Brown that's right yeah. that's the night that's the week I got signed that week that was so I, that's what I was saying was that like a tryout kind of yeah yeah I wrestled on Nitro or I'm sorry shoot on Raw uh, it was a dark okay. match on Raw with Hacksaw Jim Duggan in Shreveport Louisiana. Wow. We're going out That's to awesome. the curtain. We had six. We get out there and they stretch it to eight. And I think they just wanted to see if I could do it, how yeah. I was going to handle the pressure of changing time in the middle of the ring. Man, I'm out there with Hacksaw. You want us to go yeah. eight? Shoot. Dude, I'm yeah. 30. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Oh, you want to go? Yeah. Give me all you want. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's no problem out there with, with a guy like Hacksaw. So they stretched us, to, uh, stretched us a couple of minutes and came back, and I think they were really happy with that performance. I originally wasn't booked to go to ECW and SmackDown. Uh, Johnny Ace came up to me after the show and said, hey, are you booked tomorrow? I said, no. He said, can you make Little Rock? I said, yes, sir. Drove to Little Rock, Arkansas that next day. And Monty and I had worked together at TNA. So we were familiar yeah. with each other, and so and it was his debut match. And so for That's me to, get to go out there and just – I tried to just bump like crazy for him. Uh and when I took that pounce at the end, you know, everybody was just putting that bump over so big. Oh, they went crazy for it, yeah. WWE, you yeah. know, the office called me and offered me a deal. That's awesome, That's where man. it all started. I can't believe that Monty Brown is a, didn't do something more, man. I, I That's just so, you know, to, first of all, to TNA to let him go, that's a whole other thing, man, because that dude, you know, I, I felt like he really clicked there, and I don't know what happened to WWE. It's not really, and that's all, we'll talk to him on his show, but <laughs> what I mean by right. that is, you know, it seemed like there were certain people that they missed on, and I mean, I feel like you're one of those guys, man. I feel like they missed on you, dude, and yeah. I, I, don't, well, I don't know. Well, I feel like Casey James and I, that we were tagging together in OVW as the James boys. Right. Uh, I, I kind of feel like they missed the boat on that. I feel like we could have done really well. But at that time, it was one of those weird times in, in, in the company's history where they wasn't really focused on tag teams. For, for several years there, they would rather put two single stars together in a tag yep. team match than yep. to have an actual tag team like the Usos. And that, that's changed and all so much now. But there for several years, the tag team wrestling was just not was not a priority, was not a focus, and unfortunately, I feel like I kind of fell into that that time in the in the history of, of the company. And to me, I've always been a tag team wrestler. My probably my most success and what I absolutely love doing is tag team wrestling. And I think that yeah. kind of goes back to being a kid and being such a fan of the Rock and Roll Express and those guys. I just yeah. I love tag team wrestling, so yeah. I think. Had they been doing more with tag teams at the time, I think it would have been, you know, completely different. But unfortunately, they, they just wasn't. And it was weird, too, because there was like a, a rush of brother tag teams that weren't really brothers. So you had the major brothers. They they weren't right. really brothers, of course. They looked similar. They were all edge heads or whatever. But then you had the Bashams, which they learned that they weren't brothers. So Vince broke them up. And then you and KC were trying to do that same kind of thing. And I almost feel like Vince realizing, hold on, these these people, the, the fans will figure out that they're not brothers. So we can't. I almost feel like that hurt everything, even tag teams as a whole. Or who do you? you think had a thing about brothers putting people together as brothers i don't know i think maybe it was low-hanging fruit gotcha. you know what i mean okay it, sure it was, yeah. it was low-hanging yeah. fruit because when i came into <clears throat> ovw i was wrestling singles and everybody there from the first match i had was like oh my god you and casey look like brothers like y'all yeah. be brothers you work right. alike you look alike so then we the, my first tv like you know 10 days later, they was like, all right, Cassidy and Casey, and we're going to, you're going to be Cassidy James and y'all are going to be brothers. And I'm like, what, what am I going to say? No, I don't want to do that. It's been too <laughs> no. many brothers. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And then get, uh, we'll, we'll get to work. KC, I got Chris Michaels and, and Chase Stevens coming in. We're going to be four brothers here in just a second. Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, whatever you want. You tell me what you want. I'm going to give you the best that I can. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, we're we're a brother tag team too on here. It's a it's it's always I guess I guess the thought of a brother tag team kind of be that you you know your brother's always going to have your back, and you know your family's always right. going to be fighting for each other. Um, you know, even though they weren't brothers, I mean, like the Road Warriors look like they could have been brothers. The right, you know. Even even the Rock and Roll Express looked like they could have been brothers. I mean, it's it's, it's just it's just a natural <laughs> yeah, fit. I mean, we we pitched some really good ideas to to create at that at that time. I remember one thing that we pitched to them is like we want we wanted to do a vignette where like we were you know we were Southern gentlemen. We were sitting out on the back patio, and our back patio looked over a golf course, and we're drinking you know maybe like a mint julep or something. Here comes yeah. Tiger Woods, and I'm and so then uh, he's playing like you know hole number nine, which is in our backyard, and I get hot and like I was a little hothead, and I get up and go smash the Tiger Woods looking like, and we beat him up, you know stuff like that. We we pitched some really good ideas, but yeah. again, it, it just goes back to where they just really wasn't feeling, you know, they wasn't Tag feeling teams. acting. That time. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's that's. I mean, if I, I'll criticize. If if you can criticize Vince McMahon on one thing and his lack of genius for wrestling, it's that he just never really got tag team wrestling. I don't think. Right. All the respect you know, to him for everything he's done, but he never got yeah. tag team wrestling. Yeah. And there were so many young, you know, single stars there too. Man, Cody Rhodes was there. Cody and right. you know Sean Spears were there. Yeah. Uh, there were so many young single stars to uh, and it. So we would kind of get cornholed into that same deal as a tag team in OVW. There was only a couple of tag teams. And then you start working with guys who are two singles guys put together. They don't really do tag team wrestling. So then you're just a tag team wrestling two singles guys. Sometimes right. it's hard to put out your best work. So, you know, if you had a, a Midnight Express versus a Rock and Roll Express, two tag teams type situation. And then you start feeding off that, but unfortunately, they're you know again it goes back to they were so heavy on invested in singles wrestlers. So even at OVW, there wasn't a lot of tag teams either. Yeah, obviously you're going to take what's there for that because it's not like you're going to turn anything down. You're going to go for it all the way. So you know, I right. know you can, you kind of came back a little bit in TNA as a, it was that just like a one shot in 2013, or was that planned to be more or? Uh, it was, you know, they called us to come in for the pay-per-view and they were doing like three tapings that uh, over a three day period. And, uh, you know, it was, it, we were hoping it might would turn into something. Uh, yeah. unfortunately it, it, it never did, uh, other yeah. than the one shot or, yeah. you know, but it was always good to go back and just be able to, to see all the guys we had worked with for so long and, and be back on TV and pay-per-view and stuff. So, I appreciated it. The Al Snow was doing some of the booking. Al was always really, really good to me. We got to be good friends when he was my trainer in OBW. I think he kind of facilitated us getting to come back in for a little bit. Uh, I just don't, I'm not sure it was the right time, the right place. Yeah. I mean, talking about another genius, man. Al Snow's, I think he's got to be one of the highest IQs in pro wrestling, man. He's so extremely intelligent about the sport and life, you know. I'm not sure there's anybody else that can that can train and convey messages about this uh, about professional wrestling better than Al Snow can. He yeah. just has a way of explaining stuff to where you go, oh, I, I get it now, I yeah. get it. You know, yeah. He, yeah. he he has that ability to communicate with with guys, uh, and he is he's a great guy and absolutely absolutely one of the geniuses of professional wrestling, especially as far as the psychology goes. Definitely, definitely so. Well, I have a Mount Rushmore. We're big Mount Rushmore people here. So I'm going to say this right now on the air. So the, the Mount Rushmore of nicest guys in wrestling, and it's Kevin Sullivan, from what I've met, Steve Kern, Joe Gomez, and Cassidy Riley. So I'm going to give you that right <laughs> Man, now, thank I, you, brother. You know that's that's a huge honor. I appreciate that. <laughs> Good company to be with. So thank you. Well, yeah. So Kevin, I, I know some people probably are like, are, is he crazy? You don't know Kevin like I know. As a booker, I don't know him, but I just know from when I've talked to him, and you're one of those guys, man. So I don't know if that hurt you. I mean, maybe because you're no, a nice I, guy, people took advantage of you. I don't know, but. Hey, man, if it hurt my career, then, you know, I'm okay with that. If that's what, yeah. if, if that was something that was, you know, damaged my credibility, then I'll, I'll accept that all day. Yeah. My philosophy in life is just, you know, I try to be good to people and try to help people because 
there were people who were good to me and there were people who opened doors for me. And so, you know, I try to do that with, with, with other people and just pass it on because I have that much respect for the, for the business in general. And it's got enough black eyes. If you, yeah. know, if you can put a smile on somebody's face and be one of the good guys, then by all means, you know, I think you should try to do it. So I appreciate yeah. that compliment very much. Thank you. Well, dude, I had this, I, I had it on my notes here. I was like, I'm about to miss out on this. Let me say this. So, <laughs> so, you know, I, I let me ask, cause it's Christmas time and we're about to wrap up here and Cassidy can't thank you enough for coming on the show, man, but it's Christmas time. And I know that you got the tights and that had to be a huge, one of your favorite gifts, but I guess what, what is your favorite wrestling, uh, I guess maybe toy or act? Cause we, you know, Jared is the plastic chic. He's our action figure expert. As a kid, do you remember getting your favorite action figure or anything fun like that for Christmas? Well, not really an action figure, but I can tell you what was probably the most influential was, uh, most influential Christmas gifts was, you know, my mom got us a trampoline. Oh, and yeah. so within within just a couple of weeks of Christmas, man, we had a wrestling ring built out of that. Wow. We were dropping yeah. the neighborhood kids off the trampoline. And finally, it got <laughs> out. my mom was like, okay, nobody else can come over here and jump on the trampoline unless you have a written permission slip from your parents. So we won't be held liable for anything <laughs> that happens. We were putting out some wars, man, the neighborhood kids and all of us, all a bunch of boys. And we were, we were going after it. So that was probably one of the most influential presence i ever got i was able to learn kind of how to start doing flips and and some gymnastics type stuff that would follow me on into my career so that was probably the most influential christmas gift uh okay as as that, goes that that's cool though that totally counts absolutely that's the best one actually in your later career after wrestling some you you're actually a nurse yeah i, I sure am when did that Went happen back after when did i you... left wwe okay uh still so i had uh, a year and a half or so left on my contract with WWE when, when I got released. Uh, and one of the best things that came out of my WWE career was I was able to go out and do some motion capture for the WWE video games. Yes. Uh, and so yes. even after I got released, uh, they had just started moving everything out of Ohio Valley down to Florida. So okay. all the, they usually use developmental talent for to, to do the motion capture for the video games. But right. because the system was so tied up uh, of moving everything down to Florida, they didn't want to send any guys or couldn't send any guys. So THQ is the video game company. They called me after I got released and asked me if, if I could put a crew of guys together and we could come out and do motion capture. And for the next five years, we did all the video games. And so during that time, I was able to go back to college. I used some of that money to pay for my college and support my family and I uh, decided to go back and my grandmother was a big influence a uh, big influence in my life I was raised by my mom and my grandmother uh, she uh, she had always encouraged me that she wanted me to go in the medical field and be a nurse uh, and I knew I'd, I I was going to have to have something else to fall back on eventually I didn't want to be one of those guys who was a pro wrestler when he was 60 and still doing yeah. autograph sessions in a bingo hall with yeah. 30 people so right. I decided, you know, it was the right time, the right place. And, uh, I went back and got, got my nursing degree, uh, and practice to this very day. That's awesome, man. So awesome. Te- yeah. Talk about nursing wrestling in the era of COVID-19, dude. I mean, could you <laughs> uh, first, you know, my brother, Jared, he's a pharmacist. So you guys are both in the medical field. Yeah. So man, I don't know. We probably need another hour to talk about okay. all that. And I hate <laughs> into that subject because it's so politically divided. People's oh, opinions yeah. are so strong on both of it. Yeah, fair so I enough. I kind of hate to comment in public on it. I know no. personally what I saw, it was horrible. You know, yeah, it was, it was sure. a rough couple of years. I'll say this. I'm glad we're kind of on the tail end of it. Uh, I'm sorry so many people didn't make it out uh, yeah. and for the families who lost loved ones. And uh, I'm glad better days are here. Hey, yeah. hey, I think that's hey, a great statement. Go ahead, Jeff. I, I was going to say, as a pharmacist, like when people ask me about stuff, I'm like, I can give you my opinion. I can't give you, like, I, I can't tell you what's right for you or what's not right for you as far as something for COVID. Exactly. But I'm like you. I don't like to talk about it. Like where somebody would be like, oh, listen to that guy. Da, da, da. He's got a, I don't have an agenda. I just have what I feel is right. And it may be, it may not be, but that, that's and what I feel. It might not be what somebody else feels or what their exactly. experience was. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's not to negate what their experience was Absolutely. or negate what mine was. 
people have different lives and, and, and just see things through different lenses and that's okay. And I think we as a world got to get back to seeing that, man. I think we're in a bad spot right now in this country. We have to get back to being compassionate to other people and just realizing that it's okay to have different views because you have a different view than I do. Doesn't make you a bad person. Right. Not at all. Right. Full of different people with different lifestyles. Nobody's story is the same. So everybody's vision of how they how they see the world will be different, and that's okay. We we got to stop criticizing people who see the world differently than we do. Yeah, yeah. because you know, and we can go on about this forever, but everybody comes into every conversation automatically offended if with a yeah. stranger. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. I tell people we're all the main character in our own story. But we're not the main That's character. Right. But we're not the main character of everybody's story. So right, right. yeah, and it's okay yeah. not to be a character at all in some okay. people's story. Exactly, definitely, exactly. definitely. And I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but today you are our subject, sir. So yes, sir. Cassidy, go ahead and and put yourself over, brother. Tell them where they can find you on on social media and where they'll see you wrestling and all that. And I'm on Twitter at Cassidy Riley. Uh, Facebook, I kind of keep for my friends and family sure. and uh, a little more private, but I'm on Instagram. Uh, you guys can find me on any of those. Uh, we'll be at Value Independent Wrestling. We have a show coming up in January. It's going to be uh, Fountain Hill, Arkansas, I believe. So if you're in the area, you know, you can check out Value Independent Wrestling on social media and follow the calendars. And there's a real good group of guys there. And uh, man, it's, I'm just living life. Loving my kids, enjoying what's left in my career, and, and looking forward to what comes after when I'm when I'm through with professional wrestling. Well, I know whatever it is, it's going to be bright, and you know you're the VIP, you're the hot shot. Whatever, wherever you do, and whatever you do, I know you're going to do great at it. So, you know, Cassie, honestly, I meant that when I say that that you're one of the nicest guys I've ever met in this business, and I appreciate that you came on our show today. I want to say this, you know, listeners, don't sleep on this. Go look up YouTube. Go type in Cassidy Riley. I think everything you see, you're going to be impressed with. You've had it as long as I've known you, and, and and, and I appreciate you so much for spending time with us today, brother. Thank you. Well, man, again, it's been my pleasure. And I'd just like to say thank you guys for giving me the platform to be able to, uh, to come on and talk about some stuff that I really love and, and I'm passionate about with some good people. And I'd just like to say uh, Merry Christmas to you guys. Merry Christmas to everybody Merry listening. Christmas. Have a happy and, and prosperous new year. And I wish nothing but good things for you all. Thank you, brother. Merry Thanks, Christmas man. to you. And we'll have you back on soon, too. Okay, buddy? Thank you. Sounds good, man. Thank you, guys. Take Thank care. You. All right, Frank. Just read from the cards. I don't know, Stomper. This isn't what Sludge asked us to say. Don't worry about it, little bro. Sludge hired us for this, and I know what's best. Okay, Stomper. Cue the music, maestro. Welcome to the Monster Movie Stop Down with me, Stompy, and my little brother, Frank. Hi, I'm Frank. <laughs> yes, you are. So join us, Sludge, Mark, and Ruben, as we review monster movies from all around the world. And don't forget about the monthly contest and trivia. <laughs> That's right, peasants. You'll find extra content like the Underdogs, Monster Match Wednesdays, Friday Night Fights, each week exclusively on our Facebook and Instagram. So please join us at the Monster Movie Stop Down. Your one-stop shop for monster movie reviews, interviews, news, contests, and of course, me, Stumpy. And Frank. In a world that has been completely divided for so long, two movie fans have decided to unite for the people and the betterment of mankind. One, an action movie buff. You think I mother... The other, a horror movie fanatic. Together, they will try to bridge the gap of both genres into one podcast with their battle cry. Give me back my action and horror movies. Listen along as Charlie and Nate alternate each week talking about action and horror movies they cherish, mostly from the VHS era. Also, including some modern examples that felt like the movies they grew up with by answering the battle cry. Give me back my action and horror movies. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Look them up on Facebook and Instagram. 
and we are back with Give Me Bang My Pro Wrestling. And man, what a cool interview. Like I told you he was one of the coolest guys, right? Did I not tell you? Oh, man. I mean, like, you, you always expect when somebody tells you that. You're like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, they're going to be nice, whatever. But man, he was so easy to talk to. You know, I, I felt like uh, it was just an old friend that we were catching up with. That is exactly what I thought. I got to meet him a couple times when I was working for Saw in Nashville. And, you know, he would randomly come in when he wasn't doing something somewhere else. And, you know, that guy was, I mean, when I shook his hand the first time, he just smiled and said, hey, man, nice to meet you. And I was just like, wow, you know, super cool guy. Had him on the Wolfie show. I know I've said it a hundred times, but at the same time, you know, he was also super cool and it was just like, you know, hey, we're old friends. He's just that kind of guy, man. I feel like he is the image of positive attitude, positive outlook, and brings you good things. And I mean, he's got to do a lot. And as you hear, <laughs> he announced that he is a member of the cast of the Iron Claw movie. Ah, uh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, I'm excited to learn more about that. So it's, um, yeah. So I'm going to give y'all something, a little bit of a thing. He said this, I said, you know, after we do an interview, normally you, you and I take a little break and we come back and finish things up. So what I said to him, I said, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show. It really means a lot. Also very proud of you and happy for your news to be in the movie. And I said, you know, did you play a certain wrestler? If you can't say, I understand. And he, he can't. And I get that. Cause I don't want to cause him any concerns, you know? No, no, and, yeah. And I can't really say anything. He says, I promise when it's out, we will do a promotional episode and I'll share some details and behind the scenes stuff. So, you can write that one down as it is happening. I don't care what happens. We are bringing him back in and we're having an Iron Claw review episode. So this ain't going to get him in trouble, but can you think of any wrestlers that he could play or be? I'm trying to think in my mind, like who? It's probably somebody that we're not even like thinking of too, though. Like I, I, I'd thought of it a little bit as he said it. And I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause he's, the thing about Cassidy is he's looked 25 all of his life. Yeah. You know, I mean, he he could play. I don't know. I mean, <sighs> the dude doesn't age. I, you know, there, I know they've already, could he be Buddy him. Rogers? I mean, bro, he could be, but he's really in good shape though. Yeah, I know. Almost, I know. But I mean, they'll probably want to have guys <laughs> with movie muscle, but you know, he's a little better shape than Buddy, but Buddy might be a dude because, you know, Buddy, he can bump. Cassidy can bump like nobody's mm -hmm. business. And, you know, Buddy is that what he was a bumping fool. I mean, I know Ric Flair. It's a total is, guess. It's a total guess, though, too. I mean, yeah. I, I know Ric Flair is played by somebody that was actually in a show that I watched that was on HBO, mm, James Franco show about New York City in the 70s. Anyway, doesn't really matter. He was on that. And then the, the guy playing Ric Flair, and then he's been in some other stuff. So I, I know he's not Ric Flair, which would be amazing. Right. But I mean, I don't, you're right. It could be anybody. I mean, it could be. You could, I'm sure there's people we're like not even thinking of that. Yeah. You know, you want to think of like a world-class tilt to it, but also, you know, anyway, we're just super proud of him, super happy for him. And we're also oh. super stoked to get him back on the show when the, when the movie drops, you know, but again, it's proof that if you're good to people, things come back to you, you know, it's, it's a positive mental attitude. So I'm going to start practicing that myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There you go. There you go. I need to, you know, everybody needs that in their life, but you know, I'm sure my wife will be like, yes, please do that. But I'll just, I'll just tell you this right now. IMDB doesn't have him listed. So I know, I know. So he I, could, okay. yeah, yeah. He could be random wrestler number 20 that works yeah. somebody, you know, and that's still cool. It is super cool. He, you know, either way, I'm, I'm just happy for him. So obviously y'all, this was our gift to you the listener for being with us this entire year. Thank you all. And, you know, we just uh, really appreciate y'all for sticking around, for listening to us. You can find us at GMBMPW on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. 
Go follow us there. We greatly appreciate it. Look out for the Chic Shorts. We got those coming all the time. We're happy to have those, and thank you for doing those for us, Judd. And then always look out for Mike Jablonski's Pissed Off, our YouTube exclusive show. Yeah, Merry Christmas to our listeners, you know? Absolutely. Merry Christmas, and we uh, hope to have a good one, and you'll, we hope to hear some of the, the Sheik's uh, Christmas gifts. And- yes. Our next episode, we'll have a full report from Sheik and Sheik Jr., about what they got for Christmas, last or not. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I guess I'll leave y'all with this. You know, the golden rule is something that you can always do, and it's something that you can always have. It, it doesn't have to be during Christmas time. It doesn't have to be during any time. It can be all the time. Just treat each other as you would like to be treated Thank y'all again for being our our listeners. Thank y'all for sticking around with us. And we've had, you know, some changes through the year, but all for the positive. And again, you know, thank you, Judd, for sticking around with me and doing this. I'm glad you, I'm glad to be here and glad to do this with you. And uh, I'm glad that it's worked out so well for us. Yeah, man. All right. Well, I will see you in a couple of days, Sheik, and we will great. open up a gift or two. Listeners, thank you all again, and we will see you next time. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Don't forget, fight forever. <laughs> Colossus. <laughs> <laughs> With a tear in my eye, this is the greatest moment in my life. This has been a James Rock Street production.